So you're going to get a lot of the same information in this talk, but we'll try to make it, you know, interesting in a different way than because we it's we figure if we repeat it enough times, it'll it'll sink in a bit. So um, somewhere here, there we go. It's me. Uh, that that Twitter handle is the best way to get my attention. If you want to tell me something about this talk or you want to ask a question, and here we go. How I came to Node is. Uh, I go to Foo Camp, which is the thing that O'Reilly does. I've gone to every Foo Camp, and uh, a couple of Foo's ago, um, Michael cornered me and said, I want to understand about um, contributor licensing agreements and, and what we call CLAs, because Joanna just made a decision to kill the CLAs for individuals in Node, and he was curious what that was going to do long term, what the issue was going to be. And also, there was this meeting coming up that he invited me to. So here's Michael as I met him that day. And he said, have you ever heard of Node? Well, as it happened, I had heard of Node because just a little bit before, I had agreed to work for PayPal. And um, PayPal had famously uh, been an early adopter of Node. Our friend Bill Scott has spoken at a lot of Node conferences about how we, he brought Node into PayPal and how it sort of revolutionized a fairly stodgy engineering practice. Uh, and then, of course, he worked hard to create something called Kraken, which was released in 2014 with my help as a consultant to PayPal. And then they decided they wanted me to be their employee, and the rest is history. So yeah, I knew a little bit about Node. Um, I went, however, when Michael asked me this question and looked to see how big the community was, and this is from a joint report. These were the users that they were highlighting in 2014 to show you just how exponential the growth has been. This, I mean, this is some venerable and big companies, but you know, of course, it's grown hugely from there. Um, and he started to talk to me about the passion of the ecosystem, which is a big hook for me, uh, spending as many years as I have in open source. What's interesting to me about open source is a community and the opportunities that it creates for individuals in the community. I'm, this year's meme that I've been planting all year is open source is people. So if you're new to open source and you work for a company and you're paid to work on open source, yay you. But it's important to remember that open source is people. So when you leave your company, you should be able to take your reputation with you and bring it to your new company and, or take it on the road, do, you, do a project on your own. Open source is people, try to remember that. I wanted to see you know, how much I could help this ecosystem. So I started a conversation with this guy who was here yesterday, this is, this is Scott Hammond, and he's the CEO of Joint. He's Brian Cantrell's boss. <laughs> and um, he, I have to say, Scott was brand new to open source, brand new. And he really wanted to understand it. He wanted to get it right. He wanted, as Brian said very quickly before, really, really wanted to see the right things happen for Node. Also, it's, it's, as he said to me, it's never good when you, you know, in your second day on the job, IBM shows up at your tiny little um, startup and says, we want to talk to you. <laughs> so he wanted to make sure that whatever he did, he, he thought of the whole user base and not just the big players, which I think um, he ably did. But it really did take a lot of conversation. I, I spoke to him maybe every other week for, six months before you guys heard anything about the possibility of a foundation, because it takes that long if you're also trying to run a company. I mean, he was literally had just walked in the door at Joyant, and so he's got a company to run, plus he's got this open source problem, and he's not really set up to understand open source very well. Um, some of the problems that we discussed were, uh, oh my gosh, I can't believe there are vendors who are wrapping Node in proprietary code and still calling it open source. Is that even possible? I said, well, that's permissive licensing, Scott. That's, <laughs> that's what you get, right? Um, there were other things like that that, that we ran into, but, but he stuck with it, and eventually we started an advisory board. And the advisory board was to advise Joyant on how to bring Node to more people in a way that got, made Joyant no longer the choke hole, the choke, choke point, because they just were having trouble resourcing it for the growth that it had seen. Unfortunately, not everybody loves process, and it took a long time to have these conversations. And so um, there was a community fork while we were talking, while the advisory board was meeting, the engineers voted with their feet. And that's because open source is people. And um, this turned out to be a pretty good forcing function for us really focusing in on what we needed to do 
for the foundation. And um, we were already talking to the Linux Foundation when the fork happened, uh, but I'd say those conversations deepened very quickly. Now, Jim Zemlin, on his side, who I've known forever, is saying, you know, this is a really good project. I really want to save this project. I really want to do this. You know, I'm getting a call from him every week now in addition to my conversations with Scott. So pulling everybody together at the Node Summit in June, we sort of indicated our intention to do a foundation. And if you were, you know, paying attention at all, you could tell it was probably going to be the Linux Foundation since Jim Zemlin over there uh, on the, on the, what your left, right, is, uh, is talking. Um, and then we chartered the foundation finally. I love this kid. I put this kid in almost every slide deck I use now. Plus he's got a node green shirt on. How great is that? All right. The mission. Oh God, did I bring it with me? No, I didn't. Well, so it's sort of Star Trekian, and you guys can all go look at the Node Foundation website if you want to. But basically, the foundation is chartered to help the growth of Node through open governance and transparency. And what uh, we said in the board panel earlier is we feel like our job is to do nothing or practically nothing because almost everything is in the hands of the technical committee. We take care of the administrivia. We make sure it's really a nonprofit. We do the tax returns. We deal with the trademark and, you know, because dealing with the trademark office is not an engineer's job. Um, so those are our jobs. Uh, as of today, these are the sponsoring members. These are people who have bought memberships, and um, it's a much bigger group and in some bigger, bigger, and more venerable companies than in 2014. So that's that huge growth that you have heard about. We have a technical steering committee that Michael was explaining earlier. I really think this should be their logo. Um, they get to do everything fun, and, and that's as it should be. Uh, and they send us questions when they have them, like, hmm, can we clarify this licensing issue? Or can we like to bring LibUV in? Can we figure out how to do that, right? Um, we have some working agreements <laughs> with them. And in London, this slide was voted the best slide of a whole conference. <laughs> so it really is true that we had, to, we had to establish working agreements. Michael did a very good job during the split of guiding the iOS IOJS community through a, a written articulation of how they wanted to work together. Or in other words, how things would be different than they were during the BDFL era. And those documents are super useful. They're very clear, they're pretty concise. If you, and he did this by distilling the best advice from a lot of other projects. So I'm grateful just because it's a nice restatement. Now, as he, as he was explaining before, there are some things that we're doing a little bit differently this time for this project, which may in the future be the way things happen because open source is evolving all the time as well. So the consensus model is different than the Apache consensus model. Although we are, we are, we are emulating some of Apache's designs, we're also innovating on some of them. And we've chosen things like, instead of a CLA for an individual now, we do what the Linux kernel does with a DCO that you click through every time you um, submit a patch. So anyway, we have working agreements. Um, we are doing adjacent projects. We're starting to become an umbrella organization. So although we were organized for Node, we're now looking at the Node ecosystem and seeing some places where, play, where projects could use a home. It's been very difficult to set up foundations legally in the US under open source for about the last two years. The IRS is trying to figure out what they think about open source. Ours is, because it's kind of cleaved off the Linux Foundation, it's a slightly easier thing to do. And, um, and it allows us the opportunity to create an umbrella for other projects that are close to ours. So this is how I want you to think about the incubator, although we're calling it an incubator. I, it's more like a biosphere <laughs> or a greenhouse. And think of those big lily pads as all the projects that could be in that biosphere that, that the Node Foundation um, uses or Node people use and, and that could use a good home. So that you probably have your own favorites. After we get through making sure that this first one we're bringing in, which is, as we've said, LibUV, after we know how to do this well, we'll be in a better position to assess others that could come, but it's gonna be up to the community again, what comes in. And that's because this really is a community-driven project. That, that vibrant ecosystem that he told me about really does exist. I've done a lot of visiting the community this year, um, especially since I took the chairpersonship, 
and, um, and I'm learning a lot about them. So one thing is it's a very diverse and inclusive community by any standards, but certainly by open source standards. Some of it is because of where it sits in the stack. More, there's more design work involved in using Node than, than say, you know, deep, um, deep root stuff in a, in a big transaction system. There's, therefore, there seems to be a lot more creative typing going on. The whole IoT thing cre opens a whole new world, and because it's being invented, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for diversity there. But it is a specifically diverse group of people, both in terms of pretty much any vector that you want to find. They're from all over the world. They speak all the languages of the world. They're gender diverse. They're, they're um, race diverse. They're, they're training diverse. So there's some real newbies and there's some real old timers. It's a little bit of everything. And that means that there's room for each and every one of you. Um, the, this is the current list of working groups. One of the great ways to get involved with the community is to come into a working group. They're, um, there's regular work, and if you go to the page on Node.js Foundation website that I pulled this list from, those are all live links, and you'll, you'll see information about how each of the working groups works a little differently than others, which ones are active, which ones aren't. Um, but, and if you see something that new that needs to happen, uh, there's an inclusivity one that's not listed here, but it's just starting up. There's a period at the beginning before we recognize a group as a working group and put it on the website that people are just meeting and get, getting to know each other. Um, we did change the bylaws as one of our first official acts to include the, the possibility of member elections. So um, the technical committee always had a seat on the board, a voting seat on the board. But what we want to do now is, is move away from 100% pay to play, which is how the board is now, to better representation from the actual community. So all you really have to do is be a community member to serve or to stand for this election. And we'll be doing it sometime in 2016. We can't tell you exactly when because we need to build the membership. So the next set of slides are about why you should be a member. So it's really easy to do. If you're already a committer, you can get in for free. If you're a student, legitimately, it's only $25 a year. And the most you could possibly spend on this is $100 a year. So it's a very low cost. Um, if you hear of somebody who can't make it into membership because of hardship, let us know. Because we're more interested in members than we are in money from the membership. And you should know that you don't have to be a member to be a contributor. But it does allow you certain things, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more here. First of all, it's really easy to do if you go to this URL, and these slides are going to be up in the set of slides, so you can um, grab it again if you don't want to write it down now. But uh, it's really easy to get to. Um, it's really self-deterministic, as is open source. People who show up in increasing responsibility get, gain increasing rewards of being involved in open source. It's, it's really how much you put into it, you will get out you know, exponentially more, but you do have to put some in. Um, it's a big way that we can conceive of growing Node even bigger is to build an active membership that we can pull for, for their opinions on things and, and we can you know, bring into more and more involvement. Um, we are, through this conference and conferences like it, treat, reaching out more widely to user membership in addition to the original ring of core engineers and then the ring around them of sort of most involved engineers were now reaching way out into people who use Node in their workday, but don't think of themselves as anything other than users. And we're, we're suggesting you might want to become contributors, because that's how truly great open source grows. Um, <clears throat> we are going to be, uh, one of the great things that Joyent did last year was something called Node on the Road, which is a series of roadshows. How many of you have been to a Node on the Road event? Oh, not that many. That's surprising. They're, they're great events, especially if you're trying to learn or you want to connect a little more deeply. And we have recommitted to doing something like this in 2016 so that we're going to fund some regional events. We've asked uh, the people that want to do this to go back and give us some data about where the best bang for the buck is going to be around the world. But these, these will be much smaller than this event, much more personal and bigger learning opportunities. And we'll, as Michael said before, we are also developing other educational resources because in the pyramid of how people get involved, you start out as a user and you learn. And the more you learn and the more you contribute, the further up the pyramid you get. That's how open source works. Um, 
One of the things you can do is help host a node event near you. These, this is actually a map of node events. So there's certain parts of the world that are pretty well covered for node, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't host an event, especially if you're in an area that doesn't have an event um, or in your school or in, in your kid's school or you know, pretty much anywhere. And it's a really good way to get involved with any open source project is get involved in event production because you have to start thinking about what kind of conversations you would want to hear at an event and you start meeting the people that signed up for your event. It's a fun thing to do. Um, we also, for members, have a travel assistance program. So here's a good reason to become a member. If there's an event that you want to go to, especially if you have been accepted in the CFP and you want to speak at the event, but even if you just want to go, you can apply for travel assistance through the foundation and we will try to help you get there. Obviously, we can't do that for every single person every time, but um, this is an open source value that we want to be sure and, and you know, put forth, and so we hope that you'll consider doing that. And um, generally, I'm just making an appeal for you guys to get involved because that's, what, that's how open source works. I will tell you that uh, there's been a lot of studies over the years of us, the open source working community, because it was such a novel idea 20 years ago. Why would anybody do this for free? Why would any, why would, wh why would, how is this software even worth using? These were the questions we were dealing with all the time. And now, 20 years later, we know that the people who show up as contributors into the engineering parts or even the documentation parts of open source projects are actually more valuable as employees because you're willing to let your work be seen by the whole world. That implies that you have some stuff, you know, you're, you're probably pretty good at what you do or you have heard other, you've heard that you're not so good and you've improved yourself over time one way or another. Working in the, in the clear really, really makes for better work habits. And so open source developers actually make about a third more than regular engineers in, if you look at the whole marketplace. Now that open source is kind of growing exponentially, I imagine that will equal out a bit, but I think it's still gonna be an advantage. So even if you are being paid to work with Node now, it's still probably worth spending some time becoming recognized as a contributor because you might not always be working for that company, you might not always have access to the community like you do now. It can become the lever that you use to drive your career, in fact. And one of the things, I'm gonna say it again, I said it before, but I'm gonna say it again because I want you to remember, open source is people. If you get involved with Node.js project, you become an ambassador for open source to everybody that you talk to, and, and it's about you. I mean, Scott Hanselman, he works for Microsoft, you know? He worked there when it wasn't so cool. He, he, he didn't put the slide up this time with, with the, where he was on the little moon of the Death Star, but you know, he used to have to do that. They're changing that company's culture through open source, and I'm here to tell you, nobody thought that it was gonna be possible, but they are actually doing it. And, and being part of that, making this, this profession that you have chosen better through, through your direct action can start with Node. And I'd highly suggest that you think about doing that. All right. I am very happy to take questions, although we only have about a minute and a half left. But um, I'm gonna be around after as well, or you can tweet me a question if you want. I'm happy to answer them too. And again, we're mostly interested in transparency. We're gonna ask you to hold us accountable for that. If something's going on that you want to know more about or you can't find out how it's happening, ask us. Um, Michael told me that there's, uh, on the, we, we run the whole project and the website and everything through GitHub. And there is now uh, a GitHub project called Help. And you can send a pull request with a question in it to help and somebody will answer it because um, it's starting to get to be a bit of a, of a burden on the core community for them to get all the questions because really they only care about the technical stuff. So if you guys have any question at all, by all means reach out to us or to Michael or, or, uh, or me or anybody that was on the board. And um, I hope that you'll all consider getting involved. I'm really, really happy that we're here and that we had this opportunity to take this great technology and, and take it even further. And that's pretty much what everybody that I've seen today talking on this stage is talking about. So step on that train. I, I think you'll find it really rewarding. Thank you. <laughs>